Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, so we're getting uh, ever more complicated in our uh, compound loading. And in this case, we want to look very specifically at uh, kind of the impact of eccentric loading on a, a structure or a column or, or something like that. And so uh, this problem I want to point out because I have taken it directly from the textbook. It's based on the example 8.5 in Ebler uh, 8th edition, that's mechanics and materials. Uh, so credit where it's due, I, I think it does a great job of uh, demonstrating the effects of eccentricity on loading. And so uh, I'm going to really recreate it in my own words uh, here for you to benefit from. So we have a, a block or a column. Uh, the dimensions are shown on the slide. And the question then is to determine the state of stress at the surface ABCD, which you see is partway down uh, the column from the eccentric load of 40 kilonewtons, which is not at the centroid of the uh, block, but rather on one of the corners. And so when we did axial loading, we knew that for, you know, one of our assumptions was is that the axial load was acting on the centroid of the cross section. And so where it's not acting on the centroid of the cross section, it's also going to create a moment as a result of that eccentricity. Now, this particular load is kind of doubly eccentric in that it's eccentric off both what I would think of as the XX axis as well as the yy axis and so it's actually going to cause two moments but the nice thing is we're going to be able to use superposition to figure out what the stresses are resulting from the moments it's causing and the load that it's uh, uh, the load when put at the centroid and we'll be able to add all of those together in order to figure out what's uh, going on on that plane so the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what the loads are on the plane ABCD so that we can use the theorems that we've been studying. We know that we have to convert it such that the axial load is going through the centroid. So I'm going to start and when I do these things I, I kind of I, I try to logically walk through them and I move my load around uh, adding whatever say moments that it's causing uh, d explicitly and I do it in a stepwise process so I'm going to try to do that here. So we know that the goal is, is to move the 40 kilonewtons to the centroid of the section ABCD and, and so the first thing I want to do is to uh, think uh, I'm going to add some axes here so we can talk uh, about it. So let me just and so the axes that we're going to talk about going through here, I'm going to refer to that as our x-axis. And then this axis here is going to be our y-axis down there. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move the 40 kilonewton load uh, towards the x-axis until it's coincident with the x-axis. And so you think of that projected up here on the top plane. Then I'm going to move it from there so that it's also coincident with the yy axis. That'll bring it to the centroid and then uh, drop it down to the plane in question. Um, and, and I'll try to support that with a little bit of uh, annotations on the screen as I create the video or do the post uh, editing of the video. So I'm going to move that 40 kilonewtons up to the xx axis. And in order to do that, I have to compensate by adding a moment that would be caused by it being eccentric off the axis. And so that bending, so the internal loads on ABCD. So first off, we're going to uh, be adding a bending about XX. And so we have to add that as a deliberate moment if we're going to move the load onto the xx axis. And so the moment in x is going to be equal to the load, or 40 kilonewtons, multiplied by its moment arm or perpendicular distance. And so the perpendicular distance off the xx axis, and I'll show it here, is 0 0.2 meters. And so that's going to result in a bending moment of 8 kilonewton meters. And so here I'm, I'm going to 
draw that in. So if I move the 40 up this way, now we're going to have 40 kilonewtons here, but we're also going to have a bending moment about the x-axis of 8 kilonewton meters. And so now what we have to do is we have to move those to be coincident of the yy axis. And so to do that, we need to add whatever bending would be caused about the yy axis by its eccentricity. And so the bending about y or the moment about y is equal to that magnitude of force, 40 kilonewtons times its perpendicular distance from that yy axis, which is 0 0.4 meters. And so that's equal to 16 kilonewton meters. And so now if I were to erase these, pick them up and relocate them here, coincident now with both the xx axis and the yy axis, we have our 40 kilonewtons acting down. We have our eight kilonewton meters acting uh, about xx. And now we have our 16 kilonewton meters acting about yy. And, and give some thought to the sign that I'm using my right hand rule uh, to, to show what they are um, so that they're actually going in the right direction. Now with that, uh, of course, the, the one other internal load that we've always had, which we never really got rid of, was the axial load, but now through the centroid. And so that's P in the Z direction, and that's equal to 40 kilonewtons. And so basically what we're saying is that the effect of this 40, eccentric 40 kilonewton force is equal to these two moments plus that force through the centroid. So now all we have to do is drop it down to the plane A, B, C, D. And in this case, it doesn't change anything. You, you know, it's, it, uh, it's possible in some complex geometries that that shift itself might change something, but we can basically redraw all of this at the centroid of the plane A, B, C, D. Uh, and we will have all of the forces that are acting on it. And so I'm going to uh, erase what I've just drawn in here and drop in the, the picture from the textbook itself so that we can see this done out properly. Okay, so I've dropped that in here and you can see that's what I had drawn out. Now this has been dropped down and cut at the plane ABCD. And so we're seeing the 40 kilonewton force through the centroid plus the two moments, the one uh, eight kilonewton meters uh, about the XX axis and the 16 kilonewton meters about the YY axis. So now what we need to do is we need to look at what is the stress distribution associated with each of those forces uh, and then basically add them all together. So to, to move forward then, we're basically going to say uh, determine stress distributions And we'll start by looking at the axial load, and that's that 40 kilonewtons. Now, we're dealing solely with the forces and moments on the right-hand diagram. Now, we're kind of ignoring the 40 kilonewton eccentric uh, load. We're looking at the 40 kilonewton in a centroid plus the two moments that it uh, the eccentricity causes uh, off to the right. And so if we look at the axial load, so we'll engage our... Normal stress is equal to P divided by A, which is equal to our force, which is 40,000 newtons, divided by our area, which is 800 millimeters times 400 millimeters. 
and that's equal to 0 0.125 megapascals and it's going down so we see that that's in compression. And so I would draw that out. And so when we think about it, remember axial load, that's the average normal stress as a result of axial load through the centroid. And so it's going to be equal across the entire cross section. And so once again, I'm just going to copy in the diagram because it's fairly well done from the textbook and place it here and shows what that stress distribution looks like as a result. And so there we have the stress, stress distribution resulting from the axial, uh, and it's 125 uh, kilopascals or 0 0.125 megapascals in compression uniform across the entire cross section. And now I'm going to do the normal stress resulting from the uh, bending about the x-x axis, so bending about x. And so I'm going to calculate our maximum stress. Remember, we know that it's going to be zero at the neutral axis and go to a maximum. Now, this is all uh, uniform. Uh, set, neutral axis is through the centroid, so it's in the middle of the cross section. So if I know what the maximum normal stress is, I can get the entire distribution drawn out. So our sigma is equal to our m, uh, a moment about x, our distance y divided by the moment of inertia about x. And so that's equal to eight times 10 to the sixth Newton millimeters times our distance, which is 200 millimeters at the extreme uh, edge, if you will, uh, going out in the y direction. And that's divided by our moment of inertia. So for a rectangle, it's BH cubed over 12. And so our B in this case is a width of 800 millimeters. Our height is 400 millimeters. Because remember, it's bending about the XX axis. So that tells you which one's your width and which one's your height. And that's cubed, BH cubed all over 12. And so that gets us a value of 0 0.375 megapasca oh, megapascals. And that would be, uh, using my right hand rule, so that would be compression along BC. Compression along BC. Tension. Along AD and zero along x axis. And so we can draw that in. And then once again, I'm going to save myself a whole lot of drawing pain and just copy and paste in the diagram from the textbook. And there we have it. We can see our compression along BC. We can see our tension along AD, zero at the neutral axis. And so that would be the stress distribution as a result of that bending moment of eight kilonewton meters along the x-axis. And so our final one is bending about the y-axis. And so again, we have our normal stress. It's equal to, in this case, our bending about the y-axis, our distance in the x-direction, divided by our moment of inertia about the y-axis. And so we start our moment in this case is 16 times 10 to the 6 Newton millimeters. And our distance, our maximum distance, uh, going out from the y-axis to the edge is 400 millimeters. And now we do our 
moment of inertia. So in this case, we have a width of 400 millimeters, a height of 800 millimeters, which is cubed, all divided by 12, and that gets us a value of 0 0.375 megapascals. So a higher moment, uh, but we have a stronger uh, resistance because our moment of inertia would be stronger in that uh, vertical direction about yy. And so we get the same value, 0 0.375 megapascals. So if I look at my right hand rule, I'm going to say that that's going to be compression about CD for a long CD. Tension along AB and zero uh, along the Y axis. And once again, I'm going to bring in the diagram that reflects that. And there we have it. So we can see what the stress distribution would look like as a result of the bending about the um, y-axis. And so that's really the, you know, all of the impacts. And so if we want to know what the actual stress distribution would look like along that plane, which is what the question asks, all we have to do is add them all together. And so I'm just going to label our last little bit and basically say combine Three, distribu three individual distributions to get total effect. And so basically you can look at key points and do some uh, math and then draw your nice diagram. And once again, the uh, textbook does a, a really nice job of capturing that graphically. And we can see how they all, all three add together. And so as you would expect, when you load it up in the corner, it's actually got our maximum compression right on that corner. We have tension across from it. And our neutral axis is no longer lined up with either the X or the Y axis, but is on some other angle. And, and so, that would be the impact of eccentric loading. But it also shows us a fairly uh, powerful stepwise process of using superposition and breaking this down into component loads and component moments and applying each one individually to then bring it together at the end into a, a sum of, of all of those and we can see what the, uh, uh, the impact is. So uh, that's it for this problem. I hope it was uh, helpful. I uh, hope the explanations were adequate when it comes to moving that force around to break it up into its components. Uh, I, I certainly find this part of comp or, uh, uh, complex loading very visual. Uh, it works for me to be able to visualize as I move that load, I have to add the moment that we now got rid of uh, by moving the load and everything else. But uh, it works for me and I, I hopefully, uh, with some of the annotations that I'm going to add in the uh, post recording, uh, that uh, it's going to help you see and understand what, uh, what I'm thinking as I try to lay it all out. So uh, hopefully that was helpful and we've got uh, only more complicated ones coming. So uh, make sure you understood what we did here and then I'll leave you a link to, to the next problem.